So let me welcome you to this uh, to the second week of lectures for this uh, module. Uh, because uh, Big Blue Button is not that friendly when it comes to writing. You can see <laughs> how it looks over here. Uh, I will share my screen and I will keep all the notes on uh, PowerPoint, uh, which is also uh, a better way to actually share all of them uh, with you uh, by the end of this uh, lecture. So let me go over here. And I believe at this point uh, you can see my uh, presentation. Uh, could you please confirm that? Okay, thank you very much. Just give me a second to call some more of your colleagues. It seems that a lot have uh, trouble uh, joining. Okay, uh, so without further ado, let me, well, we will be able to skip this uh, slide because it has to do with face-to-face uh, -face delivery uh, when it takes place. However, as I always say, it's always uh, good to have over there uh, because you will need to uh, keep these rules in mind and of course uh, apply them uh, when you will be visiting the campus for uh, labs this semester and hopefully for face-to-face -face delivery next semester if uh, the situation progresses uh, well and doesn't escalate. Now, uh, before we start, actually, uh, what I wanted to share with you is, first of all, this first link over here, uh, because it is a link to a virtual tour. So. I know that we didn't have the opportunity to visit our new campus. However, if you click over here, you can take a virtual tour in 3D, of course. Uh, it is quite useful and uh, very, uh, very interesting. So uh, after the actual physical visit over there, it's certainly the next uh, best solution. So I would certainly recommend that you had a look uh it's a very good opportunity uh, also uh, we will have a virtual opening event uh, as due to the coronavirus uh, we cannot uh, attend the campus uh, physically uh, so it will take place on the 19th of october and you can uh, click over here in order to uh, join this uh, event as well uh, it will be uh, quite interesting. Of course, if you want to find more information about our new campus, uh, this is the link um, with further details uh, if you are interested in that. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see what we will be dealing with uh, today. So, today we will uh, focus uh, initially on uh, the types of loads. Uh, it's just a recap of uh, how we represent loads and uh, what um, their effect on the structures is. Um, we will uh, uh, focus uh, most of our presentation today uh, on the internal forces uh, diagrams and how you can get the internal forces diagrams 
for various types of uh, statically determined structures. Now, uh, when it comes to the types of loads, uh, well, there are not that many uh, types that we have uh, defined. Of course, keep in mind that uh, we are talking about uh, how we model the loads ourselves and not necessarily how they uh, are in uh, nature. Of course, our modeling is quite efficient. And uh, in some cases, uh, for example, when it comes to bending of beams, it's very, very close to what happens in uh, reality. So uh, our modeling uh, is something that uh, you can trust. And of course, it is the best available uh, we have nowadays. Um, so uh, we have, uh, well, first of all, we have loads that, uh, um, well, we can have loads that uh, apply on a very limited uh, area. For example, if I come over here, uh, I can draw this load, something like that. Um, these are point loads, let's call it P, for example. Uh, and we draw them as if they apply uh, on a single point on our structure, uh, because the area of application is very limited. Uh, such an example would be, well, let me draw this over here. If we had, let's say, a beam, for example, we could have a rectangular beam over here. And then we had another beam on top, a secondary beam, let's say an I-shaped beam that would transfer loads to this primary rectangular beam. So the loads from this beam will be transferred to this one. Now, the action in this beam over here, if we assume that the supports look like that, can be modeled something like that. Like a point load. Once again, let me use letter P. Now, of course, uh, this is one case. The most common case in nature is to have distributed loads. For example, the self-weight of any element is a distributed load because it is, well, especially the self-weight, if you have a uniform section, it is evenly distributed all over the section. Uh, we have other types of distributed loads like uh, triangular ones, uh, trapezoid ones, or some distributed loads with uh, arbitrary, uh, well, with an arbitrary form or shape, if you want. Um, nevertheless, all of these loads tend to cause deformations in our uh, bodies that uh, we will be uh, studying. So, for example, this load over here tends to deform this beam like that. However, we know, uh, and it does apply in uh, nature, <clears throat> that all bodies tend to retain uh, their initial state. So they do not really want to change shape. Uh, they don't even want to start moving. Uh, and that's why they react to any external action. So here, apart from the support reactions that have to do with uh, the uh, soil um, supporting our structure, we also have internal reactions from the beam to this intended change of shape. This internal reactions are what we call the internal forces of this uh, rigid body, of any body in uh, reality. Now, we refer to them as forces. However, as you can uh, see, uh, well, something similar over here, uh, these forces can be either, well, 
let me just use quotations, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we refer to the same thing. It could be either forces or moments. And of course, they are reaction to the action over here. Now, let me go to the next slide. If the action is in the same direction as the uh, span of this uh, element, uh, then the reaction will be an axial load. It means that the reaction is uh, on the axis of the element uh, as it is a linear element. So here we will have axial load and we use letter uh, N for that. Uh, it might seem strange, but N comes from normal uh, and it has to do with the stresses uh, that we will be discussing later on in this module, not today. Um, now, now, if we have forces that are perpendicular to the axis of this element, what they cause is a shear force, a reaction that is perpendicular to this uh, element as well. As I said, everything is a reaction, so it has to be uh, equal in uh, magnitude to the external actions and in the opposite direction. So here we will have shear forces. Now, typically the symbol we use for shear forces is Q or V. Uh, however, I have seen that uh, in this module, uh, S for some reason is being used, referring to shears. So we will keep this S ourselves. Uh, but typically, keep in mind that we will be using V. And in older literature, you will find it as Q. Uh, nevertheless, as uh, a lot of uh, nodes here use S, we will keep S ourselves. It's, uh, it should be no problem uh, which letter we use, as long as we know that we refer to the same thing. Now, here, if you have forces that do not apply on the same point. So here you have one force over here and another over here. So let's assume that these two forces have the same magnitude. This would cause a force pair, a pair of forces that, uh, apart from this um, length over here, where we would have shear forces, uh, it also causes a moment on this uh, element. So we will also have bending moments and we use letter M uh, for the moments. Okay, this one is uh, an easy one to remember. Uh, but what happens when we have an inclined force? Well, in this case, it's quite easy. We just need to get two perpendicular components of this force over here. So if this is F, this would be Fx in the horizontal axis, which typically is axis X. And this would be Fy because it is in the vertical axis in this plane, uh, which typically uh, is axis Y. So if you analyze this force in two perpendicular components, Fx will cause an axial load and Fy over here will cause a shear load. And if we go further from the point of application, we might have a bending moment due to Fy as well. Uh, when it comes to bending moment, well, or to moment in general, the uh, direction of the moment can uh, make significant difference because 
if this moment tends to rotate this uh, beam, as you can see over here, or if I can draw this cantilever beam here on the left, if the bending moment tends to rotate it like that, it is this case over here, MZ. And it is MZ because if you remember uh, what we showed last week, if we use uh, the rule of the thumb of the right uh, hand, then the vector of the moment will be in Z direction. Also, if you remember, the vector of the moment uh, is um, drawn with um, two heads over here uh, instead of one uh, in order to uh, show that it is a moment and not uh, a force. Similarly, if it tends to rotate it horizontally over here, the vector will be in this direction, so it will be MY. Now, this is MZ. MY looks similar. Of course, this is a different, this would be in a different plane. So this one MZ would be uh, in the XY plane. While this one would be in the X Z plane. In other words, if we were looking at the beam from the top. However, if you have a moment that tends to rotate it in this direction, which means that it tends to rotate it around its axis, well, the vector of the moment will be parallel to the axis of the element. And what happens is that this moment tends to twist this element. Now, if you try to use it, to use this type of moment on any object, uh, you will see that it will be uh, twisting. This twisting moment is what we call a torque over here. So typically, instead of MX, you will see this symbol, T referring to torque. It's easy to remember if you think of uh, twisting an object. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is addressed differently when it comes to design of structures uh, rather than the bending moments. So um, when you will be um, also taking modules uh, on design, uh, you will see that uh, there are different set of rules uh, used for the torque. Uh, we also refer to that as torsion um, in uh, design. Um, and different set of rules used for bending moments. Typically, uh, when we had the face-to-face -face, uh, lectures, I would use a soda can in order to show uh, the effect of the bending moment and then of the torque. Uh, actually, I will start uh, showing the uh, resistance of the can in uh, axial load because one could actually stand on the can and uh, it would be able to receive uh, the whole load without uh, deformation. Of course, it depends on uh, someone's uh, body weight, but still, up to a point, it's able to withstand that. Uh, and then, uh, in bending, it would tend to deform, but not significantly. So when I apply, when I would apply torque, uh, it would fold as if it was paper. Uh, so this is a typical experiment that uh, I would show in class. However, now it's not easy to do it uh, online. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that you can find something similar uh, online uh, if you want. Uh, now, how could we have torque on our structures? Well, typically, it's the effect of a load that uh, applies outside of the plane. So here, the plane 
the XY plane that we are using is this one, X and Y. So this force is outside this plane and this is why it causes uh, a torsional moment, a torque here. Uh, in order to uh, study the internal forces in our structures, uh, an important step is to draw the uh, free body diagram. This is what you see over here. The free body diagram is actually a sketch of our structure as it is without any uh, supports. Of course, it's not that we remove the supports and that's all. We substitute the supports with the support reactions. So, for example, here in this cantilever beam, we have a fixed support. So the fixed support will uh, have, well, first of all, it will have a horizontal component. It will have a vertical uh, component to its reaction. And also, it will produce a moment in order to withstand any kind of rotation as well. Um, in this example over here, we know that the horizontal component will be zero, and this is why it is not initially drawn. Uh, but when it comes to solving uh, examples uh, or questions in a test, uh, please draw all of them and uh, calculate all of them, even if they are zero. You have to show that you understand that, for example, a fixed support has three components, three uh, reactions. Uh, well, this is the case of the fixed support. Now, oh, I don't see anything over there. So if you have a pin support, let me just throw this over here. This is a pinned support. We know that this will have two reactions, one horizontal and one vertical. So when we draw the free body diagram, we substitute the support with two perpendicular forces. Last but not least, if we have a roller, a roller support, then it has only one reaction component. It's a force which is in the direction that the roller points. So if the roller points upwards, then it should be in a vertical direction. If the roller is, let's say, uh, in an angle, for example, let me draw this here on the left. So let's assume that the roller was like that. Then the reaction by the roller will also be at an angle, at the same angle. Like that. And of course, in this case, we just need to analyze the reaction in two perpendicular components so that we can solve uh, the whole system. Uh, is there any question up to this point? Uh, if so, please just type it in the public chat or feel free to plug in a microphone if you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, if there is no question, we can uh, continue. Uh, now, something that we need to keep in mind uh, when we are trying to calculate the internal forces in a body is that, well, 
a body that is in equilibrium under the action of any number of forces. For example, this could look something like that. Let's say that this is F and this is half F and this is half F as well. So this body would be in equilibrium. If we perform a fictional section, so if we would come over here and somehow cut through the beam and then keep one of the two parts of the structure. Let's assume that we keep the one on the right. What we need to keep in mind is that this part has to be in equilibrium as well. So no matter where the section might be, it needs to be in balance. Now, in order to balance, we need to apply some loads. Otherwise, if we only had this uh, part of the structure, then you can imagine that, first of all, it would move upwards. It would also tend to rotate about, let's say, this point over here. Uh, so it would certainly not be in equilibrium. Now, to withstand uh, any uh, tendency to move or rotate, we will need to have, well, since the force is like that, here we will need to have a vertical component that will look like that. This is the internal reaction, the shear force. As I said, typically we use V, but here it is S, so let's keep this symbol. Um, also, if we had a horizontal component, let's assume that we have something like that, P and another P over here. Once again, this is in equilibrium. We will need to have an internal reaction that is equal to P, but in the opposite direction. Now, these forces, both these forces, this will be an N, react to these forces over here. Of course, this is not enough because especially the vertical ones will tend to rotate this body. So in order to uh, resist this rotation, we also need to have a moment, a bending moment over here, M, that tends to balance this uh, body over here. The same applies if we keep the left part of the structure. So if I could draw this left part, and here is the section, here is F, here is F over two, and here is P. Once again, we need to have a horizontal reaction to P. We need to have a vertical reaction to either F over two or F, and we need to have a bending moment that tends to uh, prevent any rotation. So at any point, if we uh, could cut through the beam, we need to have one horizontal, one vertical, uh, and one vertical component, and one moment. It's always the case. So uh what we need to keep in mind is that whenever we perform a section and we will be performing sections uh quite often we need to substitute the rest of the structure with these three components now when we substitute the rest of the structure with these three components this system the new system has to be in equilibrium, so is in equilibrium. In other words, this 
part over here, for example, this whole thing, will be as if we had a cantilever beam. So you can imagine that as if it was a cantilever and you want to calculate the support reactions. What do you need to do to calculate the support reactions? Well, just apply the equations of equilibrium. So the sum of forces horizontally has to be equal to zero. The sum of forces vertically has to be equal to zero. And the sum of moments about any point has to be equal to zero. These three conditions need to apply anywhere. So not only do they apply on the whole structure, but also on a part of it, if we substitute the rest of the structure with the internal forces. Of course, we will see examples for that. Now, let's see um, how we draw the positive forces. We need to have um, a, um, a common uh, reference system that uh, we will be using for that. Uh, and this is what we call the sign convention. So if we assume that this whole thing was a beam and we came and cut over here, if we cut and remove the right uh, part of the structure, then the positive axial forces will be tensile. They will tend to increase the length of the element. So they will point outwards if this is the face of the section. The positive shear forces uh, will be pointing, well, this one should not be upwards, this one should be downwards. I don't know why it's like that here. This is the uh, correct notation. Um, yeah, please keep that in mind. I will change this uh, image so that there is no confusion. Uh, you can draw this uh, as you want, but still you need to keep this convention. So please keep this in mind. Uh, and M is positive when it tends to rotate it like that and like that. depending on where the section is. So this, uh, uh, the direction of the moments here is uh, appropriate. Um, I know why these are uh, the other way around. Uh, it has to do with an old uh, convention, but we don't use anymore. Uh, this is the sign convention that we are using. So let me just throw over here the sign convention. If we perform a cut and remove the right part, the positive axial forces will be to the right here. The positive shear forces will be downwards and the positive moments will be counterclockwise. Now, if we cut and remove the left part, the positive axial forces will be once again pointing outwards or tensile. The positive shear forces will be pointing upwards and the positive bending moments will be clockwise. So this is the sign convention we will be using. In other words, when you perform a section in any uh, structure, depending on which part you remove, you need to draw the internal forces either like that or like that, and then solve for the internal forces. And that will be all. You will see that the uh, calculation of internal forces is uh, pretty much a repetition of the same uh, formulas over and over again. It's the same equations of equilibrium. Now, something that we often 
use is this uh, reference fiber. Now, let me change that myself over here. Once again, so that there is no confusion. Now, why do we need to define this fiber? Well, first of all, what is the reference fiber? The reference fiber is practically, if we assume that we go directly at the edge of this beam and we select just one fiber of it, in other words, it would just be this edge of this rectangular shape. Now, it is useful to have this reference fiber because it's easier to remember uh, how to draw the uh, internal forces. Now, the internal forces that tend to uh, apply tension to the reference fiber they are positive. And of course, if you have compression on the reference fiber, they are negative. Also, if the reference fiber tends to be rotated clockwise, it is positive as well. And let me just show you over here how this looks like. So these are the positive axial forces. And this is the reference fiber. So if we have it over here, you can see that they apply tension to the reference fiber. Now, let's draw the moments. The moments look like that. And the reference fiber is down here. So the deformed shape due to the moments would look like that. So the surface at the bottom of the beam would be in tension again. That's why all the tensile actions for the reference fiber are the positive ones. And when it comes to the shear forces, this is the reference fiber again. S, S. So the deformed shape would look something like that. So the reference fiber uh, would have been rotated clockwise. And this is another uh, way to remember how to use that. Now, uh, in simple beams, you might not actually need to use that. But in uh, quite complex structures, it is quite helpful. Uh, for example, in the frame that you see back over here, well, let me just do something to change that. Okay, so for example, over here, now if you do not draw the reference fiber, it's difficult to know uh, how to draw the internal forces diagrams when it comes to showing somehow uh, what the internal forces look like. So 
let me just show what the easy part of it would be. Now, it is easy to imagine that we would draw it something like that. Sure, okay. Perhaps if we have a single portal frame, we could imagine it being drawn internally. And of course, that would be all. However, here, well, it is up to you to define how you will be drawing that, uh, because in the end, um, especially when it comes to columns, uh, the convention uh, won't make uh, too big a difference. So uh, in the end, uh, the results should be uh, correct, no matter which one you choose. However, if you don't choose one, uh, then you don't know if the signs that you have used are correct. So for example, here we might say, well, let's draw the reference fiber on the right of each column, apart from the last one where it is on its left. So this would be a way to, uh, well, a convention to calculate the internal forces ourselves. Once again, let me just draw this like that. And this one. Upwards. Of course, we will see examples and you will see how they apply uh, in practice, because I know that it might be too much information at some point, uh, but uh, don't worry, I believe uh, everything will become clear when it comes to solving examples. Um, <clears throat> now, I already referred to internal forces diagrams. What is an internal force diagram? Well, it's just a diagram that shows how internal forces uh, develop inside the structure. In other words, they show the distribution of internal forces in a structure. For example, it doesn't seem to work. Okay, so for example, if you have forces, these ones are external forces that apply on the structure. These two uh, axial forces, F and F. Now, what would happen is that this element here, perhaps a column, would be in compression. Now, if we use the uh, convention for our internal forces, Forces, we will see that compression is negative. And this is the sign convention we use uh, when it comes to design of structures as well, not only in the analysis that we are dealing with in this module. So this sketch over here would be an internal force diagram for the axial forces. if these forces were perpendicular to this element. Now, in this case, we said that they will cause a shear force because they will cause a reaction that is perpendicular to the element, to the axis of the element. So, in this case, if we apply the sign convention, we will see that the shear forces uh, will be positive. Also, because there is a distance between the two forces, this means that this will create bending moments. Once again, the bending moments, if we calculate them, will be positive. We'll see how we calculate all of them. Uh, let's see an example, actually. It's uh, much easier like that. So, in this example, what we have is a beam with a number of loads over it. And we are asked to uh, draw the internal forces diagrams, or uh, it might ask you to calculate the uh, internal forces. But typically, it would either ask you to draw the internal forces diagrams or to show the distribution of internal forces in the beam. So let me just write the two possible expressions.
or so the distribution of internal forces in the beam. Both expressions ask for the same thing. Now, the first step is always to calculate the support reactions. So what we did in the previous lecture is something that you need to do over and over again. Now, here, the first step to calculate the support reactions is to analyze all inclined forces. So step one would be to analyze inclined forces to perpendicular components. This is the first step. So here we see that we have one inclined force. So if we draw the two perpendicular components of this force, they should look something like that. Of course, they are perpendicular to each other, but we also want them to be in our horizontal and our vertical direction so that we don't need to analyze the support reactions or any other forces. So we keep a reference system. Here it would be the, well, if I can draw this over here, X and Y. And so this one is the only force that we need to analyze. Now, to do that, well, first of all, let me just underline this. To analyze the force, we will be using trigonometry, and typically we will be given an angle or perhaps two sides, so we can use trigonometric functions. Here, this is the force. This would be its vertical component, and this would be its horizontal component. Let's say Fx, Fy, and this is five kilonewtons. <clears throat> also, we know the angle over here, which is 60 degrees. And of course, it is a right angled triangle because the components are perpendicular to each other. So if we take the sine of the angle, sine of 60 degrees, it is the opposite side, this Fx over here, Fy over here, sorry over the hypotenuse, which is the force itself, over 5 kilonewtons. So Fy is 5 times the sine of 60 degrees, or let me calculate that. It's four point 
33 kilo newtons. Now we also have the uh, horizontal component. Actually, let me just write this over here 4.33 kilonewtons. For the horizontal one, we can use the cosine of the angle, or if you want, since you know the opposite side, you can use the tangent. It's up to you. Any approach is correct and should give you exactly the same result. So the cosine is the adjacent side, Fy, Fx, sorry, uh, over the, the hypotenuse, which is 5 kilonewtons. So Fx is 5 times the cosine of 60 degrees, which is 2.5. Is this correct? What do you think? Very good. Please never, ever, ever forget the units. I keep saying that, and every year there are students who forget the units. I I'm not kidding. In some questions, units are half the marks. There have been cases of students that failed the whole module because they did not add units at the end. I'm not uh, just uh, saying that to uh, show the importance of that. It is a uh, fact. It has happened uh, to modules that I have delivered in the past. So units, units, units. 2.5 kilonewtons. So now that we have analyzed the force, it is possible to calculate the support reactions. Let me come over here. This is. 2.5 kilonewtons. This is 4.3 kilonewtons or 33 if you want. And of course, now uh, this uh, 5 kilonewton does not exist. So the second step is to apply the equations. of equilibrium in order to calculate the uh, support reactions. So let me add this like that. Now, before we do that, I will add another step. Let me call it 2.1. That is to draw the free body diagram. From now on, we will just be using FBD instead. So the free body diagram, let me draw this just below this sketch. This is our PIM, AD. It has a three kilonewton force over here at point B. It has a horizontal force at point C. Let me draw this just on top of the beam only for visualization purposes, of course, 2.5 kilonewtons. It has a vertical component like that, 4.33 kilonewtons. And now 
you can see here already the reactions of the supports. We have a vertical reaction from the roller because the roller is vertical. So R D Y. And we have two support reactions from the pin support. And of course, they can always be in the direction of our horizontal and vertical axis. So this is the one reaction, R A Y, and this is the other one, R A X. So what I have drawn over here is the free body diagram. In other words, it is as if I just had this rigid body, the beam, without any support, but of course with forces on it. Now, the free body diagram has to be in equilibrium. So if I apply the equations of equilibrium, I can calculate the unknown parameters, which here all of them are forces. I can start with the sum of moments. Typically, I start with the sum of moments because it allows me to calculate uh, one of the support reactions easily. I can take the sum of moments about any point, but it's usually useful to take it about a point where one of the unknown uh, forces uh, applies. So here, for example, if I would choose point A, the moment of RAX and the moment of RAY will be zero, so it would be possible to calculate RDY. Also, if I would take it about point D, the moment of RDY and the moment of RAX will be zero, so I could calculate RAY. Both options are fine. Uh, which one do you prefer? As always, first come, first serve. Point A or point D? Okay, it's point A. Perfect. So the sum of moments about point A should be zero. Now, before I continue, I need to define the positive uh, direction for the moments. Uh, should I take it clockwise or counterclockwise? Same rule applies. Clockwise it is. Once again, uh, it doesn't matter which one you select, you should get exactly the same result, uh, the same sign as well. So if this gives us a positive uh, reaction for our dy, uh, we should get the same, exactly the same answer if we would use the counterclockwise. It is just a convention that we use here ourselves. So it is up to you, both approaches are correct and acceptable uh, for the tests. So the sum of moments about point A has to be equal to zero. Let me see which forces do not cause any moment. The forces that don't cause any moment about point A are the ones that pass from point A. So here you can see that RAY passes from A. RAX also passes from A, and this 2.5 kilonewton component also passes from A. So all of them have no perpendicular distance to the point, uh, which means that they don't uh, cause any moment. However, this 3 kilonewton force, which is perpendicular to the beam, has a distance from point A. Let me go back. Oh, we haven't given any dimensions. That's fine. Let me give them over here. Let's say that this one is one meter. This one is two meters and this one is two meters as well. So the distance between points A and B is one meter. This is the perpendicular distance of this force to this point. So three kilonewton force times one meter. And now I need to decide whether it is positive or negative. 
Uh, what do you think? Is it a positive moment or a negative moment? Mm -hmm. Very good. So it is a positive moment. Now, the plus sign is typically implied, so you can skip it. If you want, you can just add it like that. Uh, both approaches are acceptable and correct. The second force that causes a moment about point A is this 4.3 kilonewton force that you see over here. I uh, hope you can see my cursor. So, once again, we have to define whether it is positive or negative. Uh, is it positive, a positive moment or a negative moment? Indeed, it is a positive moment because it tends to rotate it clockwise about point A. So plus the force is 4.33 kilonewtons. And the distance now is the whole distance between A and C, which is 3 meters times 3. Last but not least, I have RDY. Is it uh, going to rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise? In other words, would the uh, exactly would the moment be positive or negative? It tends to rotate it counterclockwise, so it is a negative moment minus R D Y times the distance here is the whole distance between A and D, so it is five meters. And all of them have to sum up to zero because it has to be in equilibrium. Uh, at this point, I want to point out something that I might keep repeating, but uh, it is for your benefit anyway. So while you are working out an unknown variable, it is OK uh, to skip the units. You don't have to keep writing over here. 3 kilonewtons times 1 meter, 4.33 kilonewtons times 3 meters, uh, RDY times 5 meters. That's okay. However, in the answer, do not forget the units. So over here, there's no need to add the units. It's fine. Uh, however, in the final answer, you should show the units. And now, let me just simplify that i will move rdy to the right side i can also calculate the uh, this component so this is 4.33 times 3 plus 3 times 1 this is 15.99 equals 5 times r dy or rdy equals 15.99 over 5 which is 3 point uh, approximately 3.20 kilonewtons So now I have calculated our dy. This is 3.2 kilonewtons. At this point, I can apply the sum of forces in y direction or the sum of forces in uh, x direction. Or if I want, I can apply the sum of moments again about any other point. Of course, uh, the sum of moments is usually more confusing than the sum of forces. So uh, most people prefer to do this uh, with the sum of forces. And this is what we will be doing over here. The sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to 0. Uh, should I select the forces that point upwards or the forces that point downwards as the positive ones?
Okay, so upwards it is. Once again, it should give you the same result, no matter uh, what your selection is over here. So we have RAY that points upwards, so it is a positive force. We have the three kilonewton force that points downwards, so it is a negative one. We have the 4.33 that points downwards, minus 4.33, and RDY that points upwards, but now I already know it, so let me substitute it again uh, as it is, 3.2. All of them should sum up to zero. Now, if I move all the known variables to the right and then uh, calculate that, R, A, Y will be, in this case, 4.13 kilonewtons. So this is 4.13 kilonewtons. The last equation I can use is the sum of forces in X direction, which has to be equal to zero. Uh, we can see that in more complex structures, not in beams, it is possible to use the sum of moments to calculate horizontal components of reactions as well. Here it is not possible. If I would take any point, uh, these two forces would uh, create the same moment about that point. So it would be impossible to uh, calculate that. But even if I would do that, uh, it wouldn't make that big a difference because it would go back to the sum of forces in X direction. So it would be the same thing. Nevertheless, let's do this the typical way. So sum of forces in X direction has to be equal to zero. Uh, should I select the ones pointing to the right as the positive or the ones pointing to the left? Okay, to the right it is. So we have RAX, which points to the right, so it is a positive one. And we have the 2.5 kilonewton that points to the left, so it is a negative one, minus 2.5. And they need to sum up to zero. So RAX equals. 2.5 kilonewtons. <clears throat> and I have calculated RAX as well, 2.5. Uh, is there any question up to this point? Okay, very good. So until now, we have just calculated the support reactions, which is what we have been doing uh, until now. Uh, we did that in the previous lecture as well. We calculated support reactions. Now, what we need to do is to continue that in order to calculate uh, the internal forces at various points. But then equation comes in mind. Okay, I have already mentioned that we will be performing some sections to calculate the internal forces, and I also mentioned that we will be using the equations of equilibrium to calculate them. So let's assume that this one is fine. Which are the points where I should be uh, cutting my structure in order to uh, draw the internal forces diagrams. Well, there are some rules that you can use uh, because otherwise one might say, well, okay, you know what? I can perform a section, for example, every one millimeter so that I have a very good accuracy. Yeah, but it is actually non-practical. Now you can imagine that in this beam, which is five meters, if I were to perform a section every millimeter, 
I would need to perform 5,000 sections. So yeah, there's no need for that. Um, however, I can use some rules that I uh, know or that we can show um, and select specific points of interest. Now, before we continue with that, let me dedicate one slide to this and then we can move on with the example. So, points, points. Okay, anytime now. Perfect. So, which are the points of interest for our uh, sections? Let me draw an example over here. An arbitrary structure. For example, I can just draw a portal frame as before. Also, perhaps I could um, draw an additional support over here, a roller. And let me draw some loads on the structure. Now, here, uh, the points of interest uh, will be, actually, let me type them. My handwriting is not that good anyway. So, The first set of points of interest would be any point where, well, first of all, it would be the start and the end of the structure if it is a beam, or in this case, any point uh, between its line, its linear element. So here, if I could draw that, let me draw here. This would be point A, this would be point B, this would be point C, point D, and point E. So, any point where the geometry changes. You can see over here that well, the geometry actually starts at A and finishes at E, or the other way around. Uh, but also, at point B, instead of having a vertical element, we have an inclined one. So this is a point of interest. Point C is another point of interest because, once again, uh, the geometry changes, the angle of our structure changes. Point D is another point as well. Now, here, we need to perform two sections, one before the point and one after the point. In some cases, it is impossible. For example, at point A and E, there is nothing after the point uh, at E and before the point at A, uh, so there is no need for this section. Uh, so in some cases, it could be one. But typically, it is one before and one after the point. Another point of interest is a point where uh, all the uh, sorry, where a point load uh, applies. Let me just uh, In the format, what's well, strange? 
Yeah, that's okay. The alignment. Yeah, anyway, let's not spend time on that right now. Uh, so, point of application of point loads. Once again, I will need two sections. One before the point load applies and one after the point load applies. For example, over here, actually, let me. Okay. So, for example, over here, it would be a section just before the load and just after the load. Now, a third uh, set of points of interest are the start and the end points of a distributed load. So, start and end points of a uniformly distributed load. Once again. Then this will be one section at each point. Uh, what happened over here? Okay, I have no idea what has happened to this slide. Uh, yeah. Let me just restart the application, sorry for that. Now, there are some other points of interest, but uh, until we have to deal with them, let's uh, not make this uh, more complicated. So, let's go back to our example. So, here, let me uh, add the values that we have already calculated. So, this is 3.2 kilonewtons. We have a horizontal 
component of 2.5 kilonewtons. We have a vertical component of this force that is 4.33 kilonewtons. Uh, and we have a horizontal here that is 2.5 as well. And the vertical that is 4.13 kilonewtons. So, here we will perform a section that is a little bit after point A. So, it is as if we cut over here. Now, we would be perform sections at points of interest. So, three one section a bit to the right from point A. Now, I say a bit to the right because uh, we cannot define the internal forces uh, directly on point A. So this a bit to the right means that the distance is next to zero. Uh, mathematically, it's not zero, but it is uh, practically zero. So our beam will look something like that here. This is the section. This is RAX, which is 2.5 kilonewtons. This is RAY, which is 4.13 kilonewtons. The distance here is zero. And now I need to draw the internal forces in their uh, sign convention. Um, let's not get to the previous slide. I can draw this directly over here. So since I have removed the right part of the uh, structure, I will draw the axial forces to the right and I will draw the shear forces pointing downwards. And as I said, we'll use S just to uh, have some consistency with the literature that you might be using. And I draw the bending moments counterclockwise. So this is the positive direction of the internal forces. Here, it is not uh, something that you can do arbitrarily. Here, you need to apply this rule. So you should draw them like that if you have removed the right part of the uh, structure. Now, to distinguish between um, internal forces at point A and internal forces somewhere else, I would just call this one MA, this one NA, and this one SA. Now, what you see over here is as if I had a cantilever beam. So if you have a cantilever beam and you want to calculate the support reactions, you would uh, apply the equations of equilibrium. So this is what we will be doing now. Uh, if you have a cantilever beam, you can start with whichever equation you want. You will always get a result. So let's assume that we start with the sum of forces in x direction, which has to be equal to zero. For the equations of equilibrium, it is up to you to select the positive or negative uh, direction. What I typically do is to assume that the ones that have the same direction with the internal forces are positive. So here I would say this should be positive. Once again, 
in the equations of equilibrium, it doesn't matter. In the sketch, it matters. So here, this is the correct way to draw that. So 2.5 plus Na equals 0. So Na equals minus 2.5. Do not forget the units. Kilonewtons. That's it. The sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to zero. So I will assume that the ones pointing downwards are positive, which means that I have a negative 4.13 because it points upwards, and the positive SA, which points downwards, they have to sum up to zero. So S a has to be 4.13 kilonewtons. Finally, I can go to the sum of moments about any point, but typically I would take it about point A or about the point of the section. So the sum of moments about point A, let's assume that the counterclockwise are positive moments. So here, the distance is zero. So this distance over here is zero. This means that no force will cause any moment about point A because all of them are on point A. So you only have MA, the moment does not need a distance. So MA has to be equal to zero. Uh, as I have uh, said, uh, and I will keep saying uh, over and over again, if what you calculate is zero, then you don't need units. It would not be incorrect if you said zero kilonewtometers. Uh, however, you don't have to. So this is something that uh, you need to remember as well. Uh, I see a question over here. Let me read it. Uh, yes. So uh, let me just uh, read out loud the question. It says, even when we know the direction of the forces to the left, uh, uh, we always have to draw it uh, to the right and just say it's negative. Uh, yes, uh, you have to draw it to the right, uh, even if you're pretty sure, like in this case, uh, and give it a negative sign. Uh, that's uh, That has to be the case with internal forces. If it has to do with support reactions, it doesn't matter. But for internal forces, yes, it, uh, this is the case. Uh, is there any other question on how we calculated the internal forces at point A or in the overall procedure up to this point, of course? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so what we will be doing is to perform sections in all points of interest. So here we will need to perform a section before B, a section after B, a section before C, a section after C, and a section before D. Uh, well, it might be a lot of work, but this is uh, what it is, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, at some point, we will see an easier way to calculate uh, the internal forces or to draw the diagrams. Uh, but at this point, uh, we need to address it like that. So the next section will be a little bit before point B. Oh, let me uh, just that. Four point thirty three kilonewtons. This one is not here. Four point one three kilonewtons. 
2.5 kilonewtons, four, uh, sorry, 3.2 kilonewtons. So let me just copy it a few more times. So here, if we perform a section a bit to the left uh, of B, of point B. So once again, it is point B, but it is a little bit before this three kilonewton force uh, applies on that point. So our structure will look something like that. This is the section over here. So because I have drawn the section, I can draw the internal forces. As you can see, I use exactly the same convention. So axial forces to the right, shear forces downwards, and bending moments counterclockwise because I have removed the right part. I also need to draw everything else. So 2.5 kilonewtons, 4.13 kilonewtons. But now I do have a distance which in this case is one meter. It is this distance over here. Once again, uh, in order to distinguish between different uh, internal forces, I will call this one MB left or MBL, NB left and SB left. So, over and over again, I will be applying the equations of equilibrium. The sum of forces in x direction has to be equal to zero. So 2.5 plus nb l equals zero, or nb l equals minus 2.5 kilonewtons. The sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to zero. So 4.13 uh, minus 4.13 plus SBL equals zero. So SBL equals 4.13 kilonewtons. And the sum of moments about any point, but it's easier to select this point, point B. So here we have point A, here we have point B. Has to be equal to zero. And now we do have a moment, uh, moments from the forces, but also do not forget the uh, internal moment, MBL. It is a very common mistake for students to forget the internal moment and then it causes confusion because you will have no unknown variable to uh, look for. So let's start with the moments, MBL. It is a counterclockwise, so based on what I selected, this is a positive. SBL is on point B, NBL is on point B, and the 2.5 kilonewton force, if we extend it, it will pass from point B. So all of them create no moment. However, the 4.13 kilonewton force tends to rotate it clockwise about point B. So it will uh, create a negative moment, minus 4.13, and the distance from point B is one meter. All of them have to sum up to zero. So here, MBL has to be equal to 4.13 kilonewton meters or kilonewtometers as we call them often.
So now I have calculated the internal forces a little bit before the three kilonewton load applies on point B. Is there any question on what I did over here? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so as I said, we will keep doing that over and over again. So the next section will be a bit to the right from point B. And the only difference with the previous section is that now I will have the three kilonewton force over here. Once again, the internal forces have exactly the same direction. It doesn't change. But now I will call them MBR, right? NBR and SBR. So the sum of forces in next direction has to be equal to zero. Let's assume that the ones pointing to the right are positive. So 2.5 plus NBR equals zero or NBR equals negative 2.5 kilonewtons. The sum of forces in Y direction has to be equal to zero. So, well, now I just said that the last pointing upwards that's still okay. Uh, we can see that we will get uh, the same result uh, as we would if we assume the ones pointing downward. So 4.13 minus 3 minus SBR equals 0. So SBR equals, now it is a bit less than the previous one because we have the 3 kilonewton force. So it's 1.13 kilonewtons. And the sum of moments about point B again has to be equal to zero. Counterclockwise are positive. Please always start with a moment so that you will not forget that MBR here. Once again, the forces that apply on point B have zero moment. This one that passes from B has zero moment, so we only have the 4.13. And it is a clockwise moment, so it will be negative minus 4.13 times 1 meter. So MBR equals 4.13 kilonewton meters. Now, as you will notice, the only thing that changed from the previous slide, let me go to the previous slide, here and here, are the shear forces. It makes sense. Because the only thing that changed in our sketch is that we have an additional force. This is something that we can use when we calculate the internal forces. So uh, first, please practice uh, doing that analytically. But then at some point, you can perform a section before point B and then say that to the right from point B, the internal forces will look like that. So you can change the one that changes. Um, but initially, please do this analytically. I know it will take some more time, uh, but it is in order to make sure that uh, you can solve these uh, questions uh, correctly. And then you can do that uh, faster and faster. Uh, any question on this part of the solution? Even if it is a no, just type it. OK. OK, uh, thank you very much. Let me see something. Oh.
on the point of drawing the reference fiber earlier. Uh, yes, so um, now this question has to do with the reference fiber that we saw earlier. Well, the reference fiber, we could be drawing that over here, uh, but um, as I mentioned in beams, because beams are quite simple structures, uh, we don't need to use that. Uh, we will need to use that in frames. So in more complex geometry, we will be using that. Uh, but here you don't have to. If you had to, it would just be uh, directly below the beam. Uh, the only reason why we need the reference fiber uh, is in order to uh, know how to draw the internal forces. Uh, so this is why we would need the reference fiber. But here we already know how to draw them. It's quite easy. Uh, why would you not include three times one? Uh, yes, well, the three kilonewton force that we see. Uh, sorry. The three kilonewton force that you can see over here, and let me go to the section. Uh, because I take the moment about point B, let me uh, add the points, point A and point B. Uh, it has no distance. So practically it's not three times one, it is three times zero because the distance is zero. Uh, that's why I did not uh, include that. Uh, yes, why do we need to calculate the internal forces? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, the reason why we need to calculate the internal forces is because we are using them in order to design our elements. So uh, when it comes to selecting a size for the beam or uh, designing, for example, the position of the supports, then we need the internal forces to determine that. Uh, because based on the internal forces, uh, we will uh, get the appropriate sections uh, for our elements. So this is something that you will see a lot uh, when it comes uh, to design, to structural design. Uh, in this module, we will be using these results to get the internal forces diagrams. Uh, but as I said, the internal forces diagrams together with all these results is something that uh, we're using for the design of our structures. Uh, is there any other question? Okay, uh, if there is anything, just let me know. Uh, and let me continue with these sections before we have a break. So the next section, 3.4, will be a bit to the left from point uh, C, the left of C. So here, let me draw the beam. These are the internal forces. Once again, I will use a different letter over here. So it's C and left, C, L, C, L, and C, L. I have the three kilonewton force over here. I have the 4.13 kilonewton force over here and the 2.5 kilonewton force over here. Now, the dimensions over here are one meter and two meters. And again, I will be uh, applying the equations of equilibrium. So the sum of forces in x direction has to be equal to zero. This means that 2.5 plus NCL equals zero or NCL equals negative 2.5 kilonewtons. 
the sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to zero. So minus 4.13 plus 3 plus SCL equals zero or SCL equals 1.13 kilonewtons. And the sum of moments about any point, but I, I always take the point of the section, MC has to be equal to zero. So please always start with the moment, MCL. Now I have again the 4.13 minus 4.13, but now the distance between the force and the point of reference is three meters. So 4.13 times three. I also have the three kilonewton force over here. And the distance from the point about which I take the moments actually, let me write that over here. B and A. Here it is two meters. So this one tends to rotate it counterclockwise. So it is a positive moment plus three times two. And of course, the other two forces have no distance. So all of them have to sum up to zero, which means that MCL here it is. Let me just calculate that. This is 6.39 kilonewton meters. So that would be the moment over there. And what we will see now is that when we perform the section a bit to the right of C, what will change are the ones where I have forces. So the axial internal forces will change, the shear forces will change, but the moments will remain the same. I do this analytically because it is an example, but as I said, uh, we will see how we can apply that uh, easier uh, later on. So if I perform a section a bit to the right of point C, This will be NCR. This will be SCR. And this will be MCR. 4.13 kilonewtons. 2.5 kilonewtons. 3 kilonewtons. The distances are the same between the points. So this is point A, this is point B, this is point C, one meter and two meters. And now on point C, I have a vertical force, sorry, that points downwards, 4.33 kilonewtons. And the horizontal force, that points to the left, which is 2.5 kilonewtons. So if I take the sum of forces in X direction now, that has to be equal to zero, I have 2.5 kilonewtons, which is the force of point A 
I have negative 2.5, which is the force at point C, and I have NCR. So NCR has to be equal to zero. The sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to zero. So I've got negative 4.13 because it points upwards. And I said that I will take as positive the ones that point downwards. Plus three because it points downwards. Plus 4.33 plus SCR, and they have to be equal to zero. So if I solve for that, for SCR, I will see that SCR is negative 3.2 kilonewtons. Also, the sum of moments about point C has to be equal to zero. So negative 4.13 times 3 meters, positive 3 times 2 meters. And for example, you can see here that I forgot to write MCR, but it's OK as long as you don't forget to write it inside the uh, equation at all, because otherwise I would just say that something over here is equal to zero, so it would be incorrect. So plus MCR equals zero. So if I solve for MCR, I will see that I get the same result as before, 6.39 kilonewton meters. So if I can go to the previous slide, you can see that the axial force was two point, negative 2.5, but now it is zero. The CR was 1.13, but now it is a negative 3.2. Let me do write this a bit more clear. Negative 3.2. But the moments are the same. It is logical because what happened at point C is that I had a horizontal and a vertical force applying over there. Uh, is there any question up to this point? We are quite close to the end. OK, that's very good. Uh, so um, even though we haven't finished with this example, uh, I believe it's best if we had a break uh, now, uh, let's say for about 10 minutes, and then we come back uh, because um, apart from just uh, showing the rest of this working, uh, we will need to discuss a little bit about that. So uh, I would like you to be uh, a bit um, more uh, relaxed uh, when we do that. I know that uh, if we have a long session, it can take uh, quite a while. Um, so, um, well, I can just pause the recording. Last time I uh, split that, I had split that to two, uh, but yeah, I believe it's the same thing. So let me just pause this recording and uh, I will resume it in uh, 10 minutes time. Um, so uh, there is only one point left, it is point D. So let me just write over here the Six section a bit to the left of D.
Now, uh, what I will do is to just uh, repeat uh, what uh, we have already uh, seen. However, uh, we will see that it is possible to select any part of the structure and get uh, exactly the same results. So here, let me draw the whole structure. This is the point of the section. N S M. Now, because we only have the section um, a little bit before or to the left of point T, so there's no need to distinguish between left and right. It can just be D. It would not be incorrect if you said M, B, uh, or M, D, L, uh, or right. Uh, sorry. Um, because after all, it's the same thing. Um, and yeah. Any notation uh, that you will be using uh, would be okay, provided that it is clear that you refer to the same thing. So, 4.13 kilonewtons, 2.5 kilonewtons, 3 kilonewtons, 2.5 kilonewtons, 4.33 kilonewtons, and of course, the dimensions over here, 1 meter, 2 meters, and 2 meters as well. These are points A, B, C and D. So if I start with the sum of forces in X direction, that has to be equal to zero. Let me start with ND plus 2.5 minus 2.5 equals zero or ND equals zero. As I have said, if it is zero, you can skip the units as well. Uh, it would not be incorrect if you said zero kilonewtons. Uh, the sum of forces in y direction should be equal to zero. So let me start with this d minus 4.13 plus 3 plus uh, 4.33 equals 0. So SD equals negative 3.2 kilonewtons. And the sum of moments about point D has to be equal to 0. So MD minus 4.13 but now the distance is the whole distance between A and D, so times five meters, plus three kilonewtons times the distance between B and D, which is four meters, plus 4.33 times the distance between C and D, which is two meters, has to be equal to zero. So if I solve for MD, I will see that this is zero. Now, at this point, I have calculated the internal forces at all points of interest. Let me show you an alternative over here. So
actually let me do that So 3.6 alternative. Once again, I will perform a section a bit to the left of D. But now, instead of <clears throat> keeping, as we did over here, the whole structure to the left, I will keep everything to the right. So I will get rid of the structure to the left. So now, practically, I've got something like that. This is point D. And now, because I removed the left part of the structure, I need to draw the internal forces like that. And D, S, T, and M, D. Is it clear why I have uh, drawn the sketch like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So I will just apply the same equations of equilibrium. So the sum of forces in x direction has to be equal to zero. Now let me say that the ones that point to the left are positive. So ND is the only force, it has to be equal to zero. The sum of forces in Y direction has to be equal to zero. So SD is the only force. Oh, sorry, it's not the only force here. Uh, plus the 3.2 kilonewtons has to be equal to zero. So SD has to be equal to negative 3.2 kilonewtons. And the sum of moments about point D has to be equal to zero. So MD, well, it's the only moment because uh, the distance here is zero. So all the forces have a zero moment. So MD has to be equal to zero. What you will notice is that in this solution, I got exactly the same results that I got in the previous solution over here. Uh, not over here, over, oh, where did it go? Uh, let me have a look. What happened? Wow. Okay, it disappeared. I don't know why. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, don't worry, I will just add it uh, when I upload the uh, notes. Ah, very strange, very, very strange. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get back to our work. So, So, as you can see, uh, I got the same results. This means that it doesn't matter if you keep the right or the left part of the structure, uh, you should get exactly the same internal forces, which is logical because these internal forces need to balance each other. Uh, so they have to be equal to each other. This is quite useful because, for example, over here, uh, instead of 
checking the whole structure, we only had uh, to do that once for um, uh, the right part, which is much smaller and the calculations are much easier. It is up to you to select whether you will be keeping the left or the right part of the structure. Typically, when it comes to beams, we solve from left to right uh, because it tends to be less confusing. But even if you did that from right to left, if you did that correctly, you should get the same results. Um, is there any question up to this point? We have one step left, but until now, uh, is it clear how we calculate the internal forces at every point of interest. Mm -hmm. All right, so, uh, so the last step here is to actually uh, draw the diagrams. So to draw the diagrams, what we will be doing, well, you might want to draw uh, the sketch at the top. It does, you don't have to, but you might want to. So let me draw the sketch. Now, as you will see, it's just a sketch to help me visualize uh, better the diagrams. Here, I will be drawing the moments here I will be drawing the shears, and here I will be drawing the axial forces. So let me go back to the previous slides and see how much the moments at various points of interest were. So at point A, the moment is zero. At point B to the left, and to the right, it is 4.13. At C, to the left and to the right, it is 6.39. And at D, it is 0. So I would draw this over here. Uh, something that uh, you need to keep in mind is that when it comes to the moments, we draw the positive moments uh, below the axis, the horizontal axis, and the negative moments above the horizontal axis. On the contrary, when it comes to shears or axial forces, we draw the positive above the axis or above the beam and the negative below that. There is a reason for that. Uh, we will discuss it later on. Now, at this point, actually, let me draw the zeros over here. What I need to do is to just connect these dots with straight lines. and also show that the whole diagram is positive. And this will be the bending moment diagram. So let me just do a bit thicker the beam. Yeah, and this will be my diagram for the uh, bending moments. I will do the same for the shear forces. Now, I don't have to go back. I will just show it over here. So 
the shear force at point A is 4.13. The shear force before a little bit to the left from point B, so before I have the three kilonewton force, is still 4.13. And I will connect that with a straight line. The shear force a bit to the right from B is 1.13. The shear force a bit to the left of C is still 1.13. A bit to the right, it is 3.2 kilonewtons. And a bit to the left from point D is 3.2 kilonewtons. So this diagram is positive over here and negative over here. If I do the same for the axial forces, we saw that we had a negative 2.5 axial at point A. It kept being minus 2.5 until we reached point C, point C to the left. It was still minus 2.5. But then to the right from point C, it was zero. So if it is zero, what we do? is to draw a zero on the axis and then cross it out. So this will be the uh, internal force diagram for the axial forces. <clears throat> so to draw the internal forces diagram, if I have only point loads, it is a little bit different if I have uniformly distributed loads. We'll see another example for that. But if I have point loads only, then I just need to calculate the internal forces at the points of interest and then connect all of them with straight lines. Uh, don't forget that we draw the moments, the positive moments below the horizontal and the negative ones above the horizontal, while for the shear forces and the axial forces, uh, it is the typical uh, convention. So the positive ones are above and the negative ones below. And uh, that will be all with the internal forces diagrams. So if you have any questions on the whole uh, example, please let me know. Oh, very good question. So, uh, would you need to put units in the diagrams? Now, there are two approaches to that. The first one, uh, actually, this is a very good question. The first one is to add units at all points in the diagram. The second one is to add units next to the title of the diagrams. Uh, the one I prefer is to add the units over here. because the diagrams are more clear and of course it takes much less time to just do that once rather than doing that for every single value uh, so yes you need to add units to the diagrams Uh, any other question in the whole example? I know that at some point we need to practice yourselves and see if you have questions. Uh, that's why uh, I will upload some uh, practice questions on uh, Canvas. But uh, yeah.
Okay, so if there is uh, no other question at this point, let's continue with another example. Actually, it will not be this one. I will let you solve this one on your own. Or three. Let's see example four. Yeah, it looks uh, okay. So here, once again, we need to draw the internal forces diagrams. So what we need to do is to start, well, this should look something like that. This is a cantilever beam. With a uniformly distributed load. This is L. Now, something that you notice over here is that while we are given WL and, uh, well, not the point, but that's enough, uh, we are not given specific values. It could be the case. For simple questions, you might not be given explicitly the values of the UDL or the distance, etc. So you have to solve as if they were known. This is uh, all you need to do. So here, what we need to do is to actually prove that the support reactions are like that and also draw the internal forces diagrams. So the first step is to, let's say step one, is to analyze forces or calculate resultants for uniformly distributed loads. Here we do not have any inclined force, so we only need to calculate the resultant for this UDL. If we have a rectangular uniformly distributed load, the resultant will be a force directly in the middle. So this will be L over 2. And this will be L over 2. And the force will be the uniformly distributed load times the whole span over which it applies. So W times L, this will be the resultant. Now, because I don't have numbers here, there's nothing to calculate. I just sketched it uh, here uh, on the right. So step two will be to draw the free body diagram. This is something that I can do. So let me do this over here. Actually, I can do this over here. So if this is the beam, this will be the resultant W times L. L over 2, L over 2. And here I have a fixed support. So I will need to draw a vertical reaction. Let's say R, A, Y. A horizontal reaction. Let's say R, A, X. And the bending moment as a reaction of the support, M, A. 
the direction of the support reactions doesn't matter because if they point to the opposite direction, they will get a negative uh, sign. For example, we'll see that the moment is negative here. Something that is typically useful to do is to draw the support reactions in the same direction that you would draw the internal forces. If you do that, you actually don't have to calculate the, the internal forces at that point. So here, if you would draw the support, rea the horizontal reaction to the left, the other two are already in the direction of the internal forces. So we will see that here it is much easier to do that. So with this in mind, let's calculate the support reactions. Or you might see that in the literature as resolve support reactions. So I start with the sum of moments, the sum of moments about any point, let's say about point A, has to be equal to zero. Let me also take the clockwise moments as positive because I have MA in the free body diagram. So MA plus WL, which is the resultant force, times the distance from point A, which is L over 2, has to be equal to 0. This means that MA has to be equal to negative WL squared over 2. This is also what you see over here. It is drawn in the opposite direction and instead of over 2 it says 0 0.5, but it is exactly the same. Now, if I get the sum of forces, in y direction it has to be equal to 0. So let's assume that the ones pointing upwards are positive. This means that R A Y minus W times L, which is the resultant, equals zero, or R A Y equals W L. Finally, if I get the sum of forces in next direction, it has to be equal to zero. I can see that I have RAX in my free body diagram always, which has to be equal to zero. So here I have calculated the support reactions. Is there any question on the calculation of support reactions? Uh, no, because I do not have um, specific values over here, I will not need any units. Uh, after all, it could be, uh, for example, in kilonewtons or in uh, kilopounds, so I don't know what the units would be. So in this example, we don't need any units. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Okay, so the next step would be to calculate the internal forces. Now, to calculate the internal forces, I need to perform sections. So I need to find the points of interest. The points of interest are points uh, where 
in my original structure, not the free body diagram, not this one over here, but the original structure, where I have a change of geometry. So here, yes, there is a point of interest a bit to the right of point A, and another point of interest, which is point B. So I will need to perform a section a bit to the left of point B. Now, because I have a UDL, a uniformly distributed load, I would need to perform a section at the uh, beginning and at the end of the load, but it happens that these points coincide with the beginning and the end of the beam. So because of that, it is the same two sections. A very common mistake is to come to the free body diagram or, for example, to this sketch and assume that because I have the resultant, I need to perform a section over here and over here. In reality, it will not be a mistake. However, students who do that forget to perform sections here and here, so they actually miss the point. Uh, it would not be a mistake because it is an additional section. It doesn't do any harm apart from you losing some time from uh, calculations. And of course, when it comes to a test, uh, this actually can be significant. Uh, however, the mistake has to do with not calculating the internal forces uh, at the beginning at the end of the UDL. In this example, one would calculate that anyway, so it wouldn't change anything. But only in this example, typically it would lead to a mistake. So when you have UDL, the points of interest are at the beginning and the end of the UDL and not a little bit to the left and to the right of the resultant force. I hope this is uh, clear. Of course, uh, seeing more examples, it will uh, be easier. Now, what we see is that the points of interest here are only two, which is quite OK with us. We don't mind. So the next step, we see that we have calculated the support reactions. So the next step is to perform sections at points of interest. So here I will be performing a section a bit to the right of point A. So my section will look like that. This is an A, this is M A, and this is S A. I also have the support reactions. The vertical one is W, L, the moment is W L squared over two, and the horizontal is zero. So as you will see over here, because I have drawn the support reactions as if they were internal forces, it is quite easy to get the internal forces directly because all of them will be equal to each other. In other words, I would not need to perform this section. I already have the internal forces. But only for this example, let me do this analytically. So if I get the sum of forces in x direction, which has to be equal to 0, and say the ones pointing to the right are positive, n a minus, well, it is 0, has to be equal to 0, or n a is 0.
the sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to zero. So S A minus W L equals zero or S A equals W L. And the sum of moments about point A has to be equal to zero. So M A minus WL squared over two has to be equal to zero or M A equals WL squared over two. So as you see, the internal forces at point A are exactly the same. It makes sense. Now, if I wanted to calculate the internal forces at point B, well, you can either keep the whole part to the left or you can keep the part to the right. Of course, it is easier if I keep the part to the right. So I will do that in the same slide. This is the section. This is point B. Because I have a UDL, there is nothing over here. So I only have the internal forces. And B. S, B, and M, B. So if I apply the equations of equilibrium, the sum of forces in x direction has to be equal to zero. So N, B equals zero. The sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to zero. So S, B, let me draw it like that, equals zero. And the sum of moments about point B has to be equal to zero. So M B is also zero. So with this brief uh, working, I have actually calculated the internal forces at the points of uh, interest. Of course, I don't have any values, but it's still fine because it is uh, what the problem gives me. So is there any question on how I calculated the internal forces? I haven't drawn the diagrams yet. I will do that in the next slide. Okay, so if I want to draw the diagrams, once again, I will draw the initial sketch. just because it helps me visualize how to draw the diagrams to some kind of uh, scale. It is not in a scale, but it's, yeah, it's not that bad. So, pending moments. What happens here? Shear forces. and axial forces. Now, to avoid forgetting the units, just add them at this step. And now all I need to do is to, well, First of all, let me just show over here that the moments, the negative moments are at the top and the positive at the bottom. 
while it's the other way around for shears and axial forces. So for the moments, I know that the moment uh, at the top is, well, at point A, it's negative 0 0.5 uh, W L squared, or as I wrote it, minus W L squared over two. And the moment at point B is zero. I know that the shear at the point A is W L, and at point B, well, it is still uh, WL. Sorry, it is uh, zero. Uh, let me fix that. Okay, it won't allow me to do that, but that's okay. I'll do this before I upload the notes, don't worry. So this is zero. And I know that the axial forces are zero all over the uh, beam. So because they are zero all over the beam, I just do it like that. And that's the diagram for the axial forces. Now, if I have a uniformly distributed load, then the bending moment diagram will be curved. But when it comes to curves, I'm not sure if it has to uh, be like that, as if it is sagging, or like that. Now, an easy way to remember that is from the fictional straight line that you could draw, it has to go to the direction where the, po the UDL points in. So here, let me just draw a straight line first. It will just be here to help me visualize. It is not part of the diagram. Anyway, let's assume that this is the case. So you can see this auxiliary line. So from this one, the bending moment diagram has to be curved, but because the point load points downwards, it has to go below the line, something like that. In general, um, there is a way to calculate uh, the value of the moment at various points, but for now you won't have to do that. So don't worry, just draw it like that and it should be okay. Of course, this is a negative diagram, so I got the minus sign over here and that's the diagram for the bending moments. Also for the shear forces, it depends on the shape of the UDL. If the UDL is rectangular, it will be a straight line. If it is triangular or more complex, it will have to be curved again. Uh, but for most applications, we will only have rectangular um, UDLs. So in the case of a rectangular UDL, I just draw a straight line. And this one is positive. Now let me just comment that this one is straight. And this one is curved. And uh, that will be all with the internal forces diagrams for uh, this question. Now, for this example, uh, is there any question on the whole example? Oh, by the way, I did 
add units over here as if it was any example, but in this case, you do not have to add units. After all, you don't know the units. So in this example, it would still be fine if you hadn't added anything. Um, but you will not be marked down if you do. It is acceptable. OK, so this case over here, a can deliver with a UDL is a very typical case that we uh, can meet in practice. So a lot of structures can be simulated as cantilever beams. Also, a lot of structures can be simulated as beams with that are simply supported. They have a pin and a roller support, and they have a UDL. Any beam under its uh, self-weight would be this case. So what we have done, well, actually this was done more than 100 years ago, <laughs> uh, is to solve these examples for a variable load, not for specific one, and for a variable length. So uh, in the past, there were actually uh, a lot of uh, books with solutions to not only these cases over here, but more complex ones. Uh, nevertheless, in this module, you can use these tables instead of having to calculate all of them. So if you have, let's say, this case over here, you can go directly to the table. And this is example four that we saw earlier. So you can see WL squared over two, well, it is negative WL squared. Let me just write it like that. And WL, or here it is negative WL also. Um, so that would be the case. Uh, sorry for that. Negative here, negative here. Now, OK, so one might ask, yeah, sure, but uh, if we have tables, then what's the point? Uh, we will not have any question on that. Well, uh, there is a rule that applies here, and the rule says that if I have a combination of these loading cases, then the internal forces will also be the combination of these diagrams. In other words, if I had a cantilever beam like this one with a point load at the end, but also a uniformly distributed load all over, then I can just add these two diagrams together and I get the shear force diagram for the uh, more complex case. I can also do the same for the bending moment diagram. So this is a very useful rule. It is called the principle of superposition. Here you can see another example. Here in this example, I have a simply supported beam, which has a point load in the mid span. This could be. L over two and L over two. So it can be analyzed to two cases, one with a point load directly in the middle, L over two, L over two, and one with a uniformly distributed load all over L. So if you want to draw the internal forces diagrams, you can go back to this table and say, well, I will add this diagram to this diagram over here and this diagram to this diagram over here. Let's see how we can do that. So we said that this beam will be as if I had one with a UDL all over.
this could be w this could be l and to that i add another beam well not the beam the load on the beam directly in the middle so it could be p or in this case let me say w a capital w and the distances are both l over 2 so what i have to do is to go back to the table over here and add together these diagrams this one with this one and this one with this one now don't worry i uh, know them by heart so here for the first case the bending moment diagram will look like that and the bending moment here in the middle will be w l squared over eight and these are the moments while the sears will look like that so this is okay so over here this is w l over 2 this is negative w l over 2 plus minus for the second case capital w l and of course this is l over 2 and l over 2 so the bending moments will look like that and this will be w l over 4 while the shear forces will be like that so this is w over 2 and this is negative w over 2 here in the middle it's still the same w over 2 and negative w over 2 so what you need to do is to add these two together and then add these two together so for the bending moments If you add a linear part of a diagram and a curved one, the result will still be curved. So all we need to do is to add these two values together. So over here, it will still be curved, but now it will not be fully curved. Here it will uh, have some kind of an angle, a small one. so the value of the bending moment over here is the sum of these two i'll just write it analytically capital w l over 4 plus w l squared 
over 8 and these are the moments and the shear forces will be actually let me draw this over here well i add these two together so here it will be w l over 2 plus capital w over 2 here it will be capital w over 2 here it will be minus capital w over 2 and here it will be minus capital w over 2 minus lowercase w l over 2 so it will have a trapezoid shape instead plus minus so these are the shears so what you see is that i just add together the values uh the over uh, eight and over four come from the table um so let me go back to the table they are over here so for the udl it's wl squared over eight and for the point load it's wl over four and similarly the over two uh comes from that Uh, so, uh, what you see in this, uh, a bit uh, complicated slide, but uh, I hope it is clear that we just get the diagrams and we just add together what we have in the diagrams. Uh, and that should be the result. So, you can apply the rule of uh, superposition. Uh, is there any question on how I got the diagrams in this case? Mm -hmm. Is it okay with everybody? Okay, uh, is there a difference in axial and? Uh, no, uh, for the axial forces, it is exactly the same. You can apply the rule of superposition. It just happens that here we do not have any axial forces, uh, but uh, it would be exactly the same. Okay, so. Uh, if you want, you can actually add some values over here. For example, you can say that, well, this one is like five kilonewton per meter. This one is, let's say, 20 kilonewtons. This is three meters. This is three meters. And you can solve this one with actual values. If you want, you can solve that using the table and the method of superposition that we just showed and you can also solve that with the analytical method that we used for the first uh, two examples you should get the same results now let's move on and let's discuss a little bit more about the moments the shears and so on now it can be proven that the moments and the shears are related to each other uh, mathematically. Now, if we actually keep a very small part over here, if we have 
an arbitrary load and we keep a small part of the structure, this shaded one. The distance between the two sections would be delta x, which is next to zero, not zero, but next to zero. So here, the shear at the left part would be, well, something, and the change in the shear will be this distributed load times the distance. So it would be Wx times delta x, the change in the shear. This is what we see in this slide. So this is the small part with the length of delta x. So if the change in the shear, oh, okay, I hate the fact that it's like that, sorry. Let me change it again. I don't know why these slides are like that. And downwards. So the shear at B will be S plus the change in shear plus DS. But DS is WX times uh, the distance. If we apply the equations of equilibrium in y direction, we will see that. So we know that ds, if we divide over dx, ds over dx is the uniformly distributed load. Now, this is a differential equation. So if we integrate that, we can get the change in shear. So the integral between these two points of ds over dx will be the shear at point B minus the shear at point A, which is the integral of the function for the UDL. For example, if the UDL is constant, Let's assume that Wx is, well, five kilonewtons per meter. Then, if we if we have a shear over here, let's call it S A, and this one is S A plus D S or S B. If we integrate that, we can get a formula for SB. So SB minus SA is the integral from point A to point B of Wx dx. So this is five, or let me write it like that the integral from A to B of 5 dx or 5 times x from A to B. Now, this applies on any length, which means that if, let's say, for example, A is one meter, and B is three meters, it could be on a, on a typical beam. So this one will be five times three minus five times one. That is five times two or 10 kilonewtons. So the change in the shear will be 10 kilonewtons. SA minus SB would be 10. This is an example, of course. This is the overall rule. Uh, now, we know that the 
change in shear is the integral of the load. But what about the moments? Now, the moments, if we come over here, once again, the shear should be like that. If we take the sum of moments about point B, we will see that this moment, M at point B, is the moment at point A plus something else. And this something else, MB, is if we get the resultant of this uh, uniformly distributed load, it would be W delta x at a distance of delta x over 2. So it would be, as you can see over here, w uh, times delta x times delta x over 2. So we already know what w delta x is. w delta x is actually uh, the uh, ds so if we solve that we can see that well minus s delta x plus uh, sorry minus delta m equals zero or that the change in the moments over the change in length is equal to the uh, shears. In this case, it is not a minus, it's a plus. So, we see over here that the moments are related to the shears because the shears are the uh, derivative of the moments. And also the load is the derivative of the shears, which means that the load distribution is the second derivative of the moment. Or if we uh, see that the other way around, the moments are the second integral uh, of the loads, the change moments. Yes, sorry for that. So. This is another rule, um, delta x and dx. Um, yes, yes, in these equations it's the same, delta x and dx, yes. Uh, well, um, we typically use delta to refer to a uh, difference, uh, difference in um, dimensions. Uh, while in mathematics, if we have only a single variable um, in a differential equation, we use d instead of delta. Uh, so it's just because um, in mathematics we use d, while in um, mechanics we use delta. That's uh, why. But as a result, uh, it is the same here. Uh, in general, um, all you need to keep in mind from these slides is that the moments and the shears are related to each other. Uh, we will summarize that in this slide over here. So the second derivative of the moments is the load the second derivative well this plus here the second derivative of the shears the first derivative of the shears is the load or the shears are the first derivative of the moments uh, what i want you to keep in mind is that this is how they are related to each other <clears throat> mathematically uh, you would not need to prove 
uh, this uh, formula over here, you can use it uh, at any point. Now, uh, we know that they are related like that. So, well, uh, we could see this example. Of course, it could take quite some time. Um, let's see perhaps a different example. Let's see an easier example. Um, well, same. Um, yeah, OK. I do have the solution over here. But instead of um, going through that point to point, let's solve another one. Let me. Let's call it 7.0. So let's assume that we have the previous example. With the cantilever beam. And here we have the UDL on the beam. Let's say W equals four kilonewtons per meter. Let's make it a bit different. Also, let's assume that this is 20 meters. Well, OK, 20 meters is very large. Let's make it 10 meters. This can be point A, this is point B. Uh, yes, uh, I will be uh, adding the solutions to these examples uh, on Canvas, yes. Uh, we just don't have enough time to go through them uh, right now uh, in the lecture. Um, so yeah, don't worry about the examples. The examples will be solved, but I will also add some examples for you to solve uh, your own. Yes. Um, so here, if we were to use equations rather than the method that we saw earlier, what we need to do is to construct an equation for the shear forces. Now, we can say that, well, we know that ds over dx equals the distribution of the load over the structure. So the S, the shears over here would be the integral of Wx dx. Now, if we substitute Wx, Wx is a constant number here because it's a rectangular uh, uniform distributed load. It's four kilonewtons per meter. So it's the integral of four dx or just four times x. Now, at this point, um, we need to keep in mind that uh, typically we would have a um, uh, constant over here, so it would be plus C. So typically it would look like that. However, we know, and we will be proving that later on, that this C here, in this case, will be zero. It can be proven if, for example, we substitute 
in the equation of the shares uh, some of these uh, values. We know how much the share is at the beginning and at the end of this beam. So we uh, can use that in order to calculate C. Let's just do that. So the shear, first of all, we need to define the uh, start of the axis. So let's go from left to right. So this would be X. So the shear at X equals 10 meters, which is the shear at point B, is four times 10 meters plus C, which is um, Let me see something. Uh, yeah. So, um, oh, we should go the other way around to get zero. Yes, here it will not be zero. Uh, hmm. Um, okay, let me uh, explain something. Uh, here, actually, the load, because it points downwards, it will be negative. Uh, it uh, will be negative because, um, well, <laughs> The convention says that the shears that uh, would point upwards uh, here uh, would be positive. So instead of just four, I should uh, use a sign over here. I should say it is minus four. So here it should be minus, and here it should be minus as well. Now, when we reach this point, sorry for that, this will not be the case. I will explain why. It will not be the case because it would be the case if we went from right to left, from left to right. I will just solve for C. So here uh, at point B, we know that we have no shears. We know that because we saw in the example before that it is zero. So SB is zero. So like that, we can solve for C. So C will be. 40 kilonewtons. So this equation will be S of X equals minus four times X plus 40. And the result will be in kilonewtons provided that X is in meters. Now, if we go to the bending moments, the bending moments are the integral of the shear forces. So this is the integral of minus four X plus 40 and all of that dx. So this would be negative 4x squared over 2 plus 40x plus another constant, let's say c2. So let's call this one c1 instead. So here, to calculate C2, once again, oh, this is MX. 
we will need to use a known moment. We know that the moment at point B is zero, so we can use that uh, to solve for this example. Let me just copy that. So, m of x is minus 2x squared plus 40x plus c2. But I know that m at x equals 10 meters or m of 10 is 0. So, I know that minus 2 times 10 squared plus 40 times 10 plus C2 equals 0. So here I can solve for C2. C2 is 2 times 10 squared is 200. 40 times 10 is 400. So the sum over here is 200. So C2 is minus 200 kilonewton meters. So, m as a function of x will be minus 2x squared plus 40x minus 200. And the result will be in kilonewton meters provided that x is given in meters. Now, if you want to use that uh, in order to draw the uh, bending moment and the shear forces diagrams, you will get the diagrams that uh, we showed earlier. So we can see over here that the shear forces diagram needs to be to have a linear form, uh, but the bending moment diagram will have a curved form. Um, yeah, let me just read this question. Um, Oh, yes. Um, okay, so uh, there is a question on uh, why we are uh, doing integration over here. Uh, the reason why we are doing integration is because uh, we are trying to define formulas for the bending moments and the shear forces all over the beam instead of calculating that at specific points. Um, actually, the first method used in order to draw the internal forces diagrams was this mathematical method instead of what we saw earlier uh, with the points of interest. Uh, the method with the points of interest is a simplified method that uh, we can use instead of that uh, if we don't have very strange load cases. Um, we could use this method, for example, let me show you another example. We won't solve that, but it's just so that you see what it looks like. So 7.1. Anytime now. Come on. What is it doing? Yes, please. Okay, so if we had, let's say, a beam with very strange loads on it, so let's assume that the loads looked something like that.
Now, in this case, it would not be possible to uh, use the method that we saw earlier with the points of interest because the, uh, the graphs will be quite strange. They will not be linear or they will not be simply curved. Um, the equation uh, of the CRs and the pending moments will change a lot. So in this case, if we are given a formula for the load, we will need to uh, integrate in order to get the CS and the bending moments instead of just calculating at uh, particular points. That's the main reason uh, why we show this uh, method. Also, uh, just to put it in context, uh, this analytical method with integration is something that is used in the structural software uh, that uh, a lot of you will be using in practice. So this software actually does that instead of, well, it does that in specific, it uses specific methods, but it does integrate instead of just calculating at uh, particular points um, in order to get more complex um, formulation for uh, our structures. I hope uh, at some point it uh, at some level it answers your uh, question. I see some more typing. Yes. Uh, yes, you might be given. Most of the questions will not have uh, so complex loads, uh, but uh, there can be uh, at least uh, one or two questions where uh, you will be given a formula instead of uh, just the values, yes, of simple ones. Um, is there any uh, other question on what we just saw? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, if there's no question at this point, I understand that uh, you will have to go through the notes uh, yourselves and perhaps see some more worked examples. Um, let me just move on with the slides. Here, this would be another example where we would do exactly the same thing. Um, there's another point uh, that I would like to stand uh, here. It has to do with hinges. Now, hinges are practically a pinned support between members. So what a hinge does is to ensure that the two members cannot uh, move uh, in relationship to, to each other, but they could rotate. So for example, BC, if it had no support over here, it could rotate like that uh, about point B. Now, hinges are quite useful uh, for a specific reason. Hinges do not develop any moment. 
Now, if we have something like that, then uh, we know that the moment the internal force, the well, force perhaps in quotations, but the internal moment, let's say, uh, at point B will be zero. This is very useful because we can use it to analyze more complex structures like this one. Otherwise, it would be difficult to calculate the support reactions. For example, over here, we would have, let me just draw one vertical, one horizontal, and one bending moment. So R A Y, R A X and M A. And we would also have this one is supposed to be a roller. So this would be R C Y. So in this example here, we would have four support reactions, but only three equations of equilibrium. So it would be almost impossible to calculate. Well, it would be impossible if we didn't have the hints to calculate the support reactions. However, because we have the hints and we know the internal forces here, what we can do is to perform a section. So if we perform a section, let's say a little bit to the right or a bit to the uh, a little bit to the left of point B, depending on which component we keep, we can use the internal forces to calculate the support reaction. It is what you see over here. So here we perform the section. Actually, let's start from this part at the bottom right corner. So here we perform the section a little bit to the right of point B. We will have a shear force and an axial force. So we will have, well, this would look like that, S, B to the right and N, B to the right. But we know that the moment over here, M, B is zero. Because we know that, if we take the moments about point B, all of these forces will be will have a zero moment. In other words, if we take the moment about point B, it is possible to calculate CY or RCY, the reaction. Is it clear why we can calculate RCY if we perform a section? It is because all of these, even though they are unknown, they have no moment, so they do not contribute to this uh, formula. So the contribution comes only from the loads between B and C and from the support reaction. And this is why I can calculate the support reaction. Now, if I calculate RCY, I can go back over here. Well, I don't have to go back directly. Uh, what you should do to calculate these reactions at point A is to calculate uh, NBR and SBR. You will need them because they come here in these uh, formulas, uh, they come in the equations over here. Uh, so you would need them in this case. Now, this will be NB left, which is equal to NBR. And this would be SB left, which is equal to SBR. Let's see an example. Well, have a good time. Yeah, okay, we'll have some time. Let's see an example for that to 
make it easier to comprehend what I have just said about the hinges. So let's assume that this is the case. We have a load over here, 10 kilonewtons. Perhaps we have, a, let's say, another load over here, 5 kilonewtons. And the distances are, let's say that all of them are 2 meters. Okay, perhaps this one could be 3 meters, it's a bit larger. This is point A, point B, point C, point D, and point E. So I need to calculate the support reactions. This is the question. Now, it is like before, so we will have a vertical component here and three components of reactions over here. So what I will do is to start from the right part where I have only one unknown variable. So in part C E What I have is a support reaction R E Y. I have a load over here, ten kilonewton. And these are two meters each. And here I will have the uh, a vertical and a horizontal component. Uh, as I said, it is useful if you draw them like the internal forces. So let me draw them like that. Actually, this will be the uh, shear at point C. This will be the axial at point C. The moment at point C is zero, so I will just not draw that at all. <clears throat> so if I get the sum of moments about point C, and this is point C, it has to be equal to zero. So perhaps I can say that the clockwise moments are positive. This means that the 10 kilonewton force times the distance, 2 meters, minus REY times 4 meters, which is the whole distance, has to be equal to zero. So REY has to be equal to 20 over 4 or 5 kilonewtons. <clears throat> now, because I have calculated that, I can calculate the rest and then go back to the uh, other part of the structure. So if I get to the sum of forces in y direction, which has to be equal to zero, let's say that the ones pointing upwards are positive. I have SC minus 10 plus 5 equals 0, or SC equals 5 kilonewtons. Of course, 
the sum of forces in x direction also has to be equal to zero. So nc equals zero. Now that I know everything over here, I can go to part or component if you want, AC, and do exactly the same. So here I will have a vertical reaction, RAY, a horizontal reaction, RAX, and the bending moment, MA. I have a five kilonewton force over here. This is two meters, this is three meters. And now, because it is a section, the internal forces I calculated at point C will also apply over here because it is still point C. So it is the same internal forces, but they will have the opposite direction because now I have removed the right part instead of the left part. So this will be NC, that is zero. This will be SC, which is five kilonewtons. And of course, we have the moment which is zero. So if I apply the equations of equilibrium, I can say that the sum of moments about point A has to be equal to zero. So MA minus five times two plus five times five equals zero or MA equals, this one is 10, this one is 25, so MA plus, 20, plus 15 is zero, or MA is negative 15 kilonewtometers. The sum of forces in Y direction has to be equal to zero. Let's take the ones pointing upwards. So RAY plus five minus five, equals zero or r a y equals zero as well and the sum of forces in x direction has to be equal to zero so r a x minus zero is zero or r a x is zero so as you can see, I was able to calculate the support reactions for the whole structure, even though I have more than three support reactions. Uh, is there any question over here in this example? I know that it might be a bit rushed, uh, but yeah, feel free to ask, please. Uh, let's see, let me have a look. Uh, oh, uh, it has to do with the um, uh, direction that I assume to be positive. Actually, it's positive in both cases. It's not negative, uh, let's see. But it has to do with the assumption I make in order to calculate the unknown variables. Yes, it is acting in opposite directions uh, because I have performed the cut. So let me go back a few slides.
well, quite a few slides. It's over here. So here, what you can see is that our case is this one. So when I first perform the cut, this would be actually, let me change that. And that. So here it would be pointing upwards because I removed the left part and kept the right part. Here it would be pointing uh, downwards because I removed the right part and kept the left one. Uh, if you perform a section, the internal forces in both sides have to add up to zero, so they have to balance each other. Uh, and that's why they need to have the opposite direction. As you can see here, the moments have the opposite direction as well, and the axles have the opposite direction too. Um, I hope it um, answers your question. Uh, does it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? Okay, so uh, if there is no other question, uh, we can uh, close this uh, lecture. Um, I will upload all notes, of course, on uh, Canvas. I will also have some um, questions for you to uh, work on and ask many questions you might have. Um, if you see that um, the whole thing seems to be uh, quite confusing, then uh, perhaps uh, we might um, have to schedule an extra session uh, in order to cover some more examples. Because um, judging from the schedule, uh, we won't have time to do that uh, next week. So we might have to schedule another one. Of course, if you feel that it is uh, OK, then I'm certainly happy with that. Um, OK, so I will now be uh, stopping the recording. And uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you for bearing with me. And um, see you next week, unless, of course, we will uh, schedule another tutorial uh, session.